I'm Ryan from Next Up Calgary, and I'm here with Laura Benson, uh, who works with the Beyond Coal campaign at the Dogwood Initiative. Um, so, Laura, can you give us a bit of a sense uh, about that campaign and the work that you do at Dogwood? For sure. Um, so, our Beyond Coal campaign is really focused on uh, stopping the expansion of U.S. thermal coal exports in, in, through BC's ports. Um, so, we're seeing sort of an onslaught of, since about 2011, of coal coming from U uh, U.S. mines in Mo Montana and Wyoming, looking for a way to get to Asian markets where they burn it in their power plants there. Um, BC is, has sort of been the easiest place, the easiest target on their map, because we have existing coal terminals and uh, relatively weak environmental laws and public process for these proposals. So we've been fighting a proposal to bring uh, up to 8 million tons more of that stuff from uh, Montana all the way to Fraser Street Docks in BC. Um, and we've been applying Dogwood's sort of signature mix of uh, online organizing and offline organizing um, with you know, building a, a broad base of support um, on the ground and mobilizing around key decision points and really forcing governments to consult the public when they wouldn't have otherwise right. on this project. That sounds really important. I'm going to have a few more questions about your community engagement model, but first I'm wondering if you can just give us, for folks who don't know maybe, um, we have a lot of coal uh, production and use in terms of our energy um, mix here in Alberta, and yeah. I don't know if you can give us a bit of more of a sense of coal and the environmental effects and potentially effects on nearby communities. Sure. Um, I'm going to start with local impacts from the perspective of my campaign. So the transport of coal, and we were talking about this just a minute ago, right, at every point is, threatens the, the health of, of local people and the environment, right? So it's where it's mined um, is incredibly destructive. When it's put onto trains and it's sent through thousands of communities through the western United States, dust is flying off from this, of these coal cars. Um, polluting waterways, uh, creating toxins in the air, all the way to BC. And the same thing, you know, at every step along the way, those, those health and environmental impacts are felt disproportionately by people who live along that transport route. And then, of course, we all know that when coal is burned, it's the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world, right? It's the, it accounts for I think a third of, of global warming pollution, right? And for every ton of coal that we put into a power plant, we get two tons out of uh, greenhouse gas global warming pollution. So it's, a, it's an intense local issue. It's an extremely important global issue. We have to get ourselves off coal. Right, great. Um, and so now thinking about that and that this is a big thing we have to work on in Alberta, obviously, is the coal, um, huge like depth of coal projects happening here. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about your community engagement model and how maybe other campaigns that you've had in the past that have been successful and how you've engaged communities and built power behind those campaigns? Sure. Yeah, well, we um, Dogwood has gone through uh, a lot of change over the years um, since it started 15 years ago. And just over the past two years, we've really um, gone deep into an engagement organizing model where we are trying to build um, semi-autonomous local teams throughout the province to take on these fights because it starts locally, right, with the impacts of a coal train on your neighborhood. Um, and if you can do something about that, it has a global implica implications, right? And so every, all politics is local. Um, and, and we started to realize, particularly, I mean, for the past eight years now, Dogwood's main campaign has been fighting the, the oil pipeline and tanker proposals, right. um, and Bridge Northern, Northern Gateway and uh, the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain pro proposal. Um, and it's been, become increasingly clear that we can't trust um, the government review processes, particularly federal government <laughs> review processes, to respect uh, what British Columbians are saying about this project, which is a resounding no way, not in our province. Um, so it became increasingly clear that we had to build power to win these campaigns. 
and that it has to be resilient. So we can't, it can't just be winning one election or uh, mobilizing 4,000 people to the joint review panel hearings on the Ambridge Northern Gateway pro proposal. It has to last um, and it has to be grounded in people's local communities. Um, so that's why we, we turned to this engage, engagement organi organizing model um, so that we can go big across the province and have an ever more powerful and larger network, but also go deep uh, and build relationships with people that are going to make that last. So how many of these autonomous groups or send me autonomous groups do you have across the province then? Um, I think we're, we're well over 100 team, wow, local amazing. teams in uh, 37 of our 85 provincial ridings and our goal is to have um, multiple teams in, in all 85 ridings so that we could uh, launch, if we need to, a citizens initiative in BC right. requiring the provincial government to deny permits for uh, oil, crude oil pipelines. Right. And that, luckily, that makes us ready for anything. So mm -hmm. makes us ready for the federal election, the municipal elections, whatever big decision points are coming up. Right. That's great. Um, and definitely lots to learn from that here. Um, I know that right now we're sitting on Treaty 6 territory. I'm from Treaty 7 territory, um, the home of the Nisitapi, Nakoda, and Sisutina people um, in a lot of BC is unceded Absolutely. territory. I'm wondering, um, in terms of these local organizing groups, uh, the relationship with local Indigenous communities and how you build um, indigenous sovereignty because it's indigenous land and also even yeah. from a legal standpoint, um, exactly. indigenous peoples have um, a lot more leverage over land that is theirs, of yeah. course. Um, not enough leverage as they should, but right. um, I'm wondering how you build that into your engagement model. Um, well, I, at this point, I would say there's, there are parallel strategies and that, and this is, you know, our, our movement to build political power among everyday British Columbians has really been to try to build uh, support around First Nation strategies as right. well, right? So, um, like you said, there there are a lot more. There's a lot more leeway for legal strategies on the First Nation side, and we want to do everything we can to support that and make sure that we're fighting on all fronts, so that in the end we all win together. Right. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up. Maybe if you. As we're finishing, I know that you live on Burnaby Mountain. I don't know if you have any like <laughs> reflections from the recent struggles that have been happening there, and then we'll wrap up. Oh goodness, I don't know if I have a quick one. It was really mm. intense. It was really intense, and it, uh, I mean, obviously it, it it hit home for me directly because I live there. Um, but I think that just reinforced how important it is to to organize from the ground up and to start to meet people where they are. Um, so all of these projects affect us directly at home in some way or another, and if we can, if we can build power around that, then we can take on what seems like an insurmountable global issue of climate change. Right. Thank you very much, Laura. Thanks.